The developmental information presented in this video is just a guideline for what might be observed in a child at a given age. Please keep in mind that every child is different and may develop earlier or later than these norms suggest. A newborn baby comes into the world physically helpless and totally dependent on others for everything in order to survive. But in a few very short years, that baby becomes a child so capable and independent that if you hadn't seen it for yourself, you'd hardly believe it was possible. How does this astounding physical transformation occur and in the span of just five birthdays? The physical development in the first 12 months is more rapid than at any other time of life. It begins with a puzzling collection of involuntary or primitive reflexes, many of which disappear by about the fourth month. Many of the reflexes serve sort of an adaptive value. So for example, there's a rooting reflex where if you stroke the infant's cheek, they turn and open their mouth up. And at first it seems like sort of an odd thing, but it allows the infant to get food very easily. Um, there are quite a few reflexes like that that have somewhat of an adaptive value. Um, other reflexes like a grasping reflex, if you put anything into an infant's hand, they grasp it very um, strongly, can also have adaptive value in terms of helping the infant uh, catch themselves if they begin to fall. If their hand hits something, they might grab onto it, and that might break their fall. Although the newborn's nervous system is still immature, the sense of smell, taste, touch, and hearing appear to be well-developed at birth. Doctors used to think that young infants couldn't experience pain or displeasure, and it's very clear that they can. Um, and they are quite sensitive to touch, especially around the face region. There's every evidence that their hearing is just as good as ours. Um, and they seem, there are some studies that indicate that babies actually hear quite well um, during the last trimester pregnancy in, in utero. There have been studies where they uh, have mothers read a story to their child every day during the last trimester. Imagine just reading to your large belly and what a sort of funny image this is. So reading the cat in the hat, for example, over and over again. And then that babies prefer to listen to the cat in the hat over other stories um, in the first few days of life. We sat in the house on that cold, cold, wet day. It turns out that sense of smell and sense of taste are also very um, sort of advanced when the infant comes into the world. Um, infants show the same kind of reactions to bitter tastes or foul-smelling odors that adults do for the most part. So you'll see children do facial grimaces if you put um, something bitter in their mouth. And uh, so they seem to become into the world with some kind of pre-programmed ways of, of smelling, tasting, and, and uh, feeling. A newborn's vision, however, won't be fully developed for several more months. They're legally blind, but that's at birth. But that's not mean doesn't mean they can't see. It has more to do with the fact that everything appears very fuzzy, um, and they also don't have very developed depth perception. Their two eyes are not working together um, at birth the way ours do. The other interesting thing is we talk about focusing, about gaze. That by six to eight weeks they should be able to focus and follow, th or three months certainly, they should be able to now turn their head from right to left 180 degrees. But what, when they first focus, what do they look at? Do they look you in the eye? No. They seem to look at the top of your head. And probably what they're looking at is the dark light contrast of your hair to the wallpaper behind you or of your forehead skin to, to your darker hair. And, they're, and later on, by three months, they'll make eye-to-eye -eye contact and seem as if they're ready to start communicating then. The first smile is an exciting developmental milestone for newborns and their parents. At about four to six weeks, a baby is finally able to voluntarily smile at someone or something. But up to that point, newborns seem rather distant and serious. The first smiles that you see in newborn babies, which are not what we call the social smiles, but you may even see them in the first few days of life, often when a baby is in light sleep, they're, you know, you'll see a smile sort of pass across their face. And um, sometimes you'll hear someone say, oh, he's having a nice dream. Well, in fact, that's not what that's about. They're just these fluctuations of the central nervous system that seem to be associated with these little smiles. In fact, the less well-developed the cortex is, the more we see them. So the more premature the baby is, the more we see these little sleep smiles. And as the baby matures, they drop out. But then the, <clears throat> the social smile 
which is what we call that smile that first that, that parents see when the baby's awake, that smile is in response to social stimulation. Usually uh, face and voice together is what's going to most, be most likely to elicit it. Slowly, babies begin to mature and adopt a schedule, with longer stretches of time during the day when they're able to be alert and content, and longer hours of sleep at night. In the first three weeks of life, they'll cry four hours, spend four hours out of the day crying, one hour alert, attentive, seemingly. By three months, one hour out of the day crying, four hours out of the day alert, attentive, and now cooing, giggling, laughing, reaching out, uh, and that sort of thing. But it's probably the rapid growth and weight gain during the first year that's most astounding. In fact, babies grow so fast that some parents take a picture of their baby each month sitting in exactly the same place with the same toy in order to keep track of the unbelievable change in size from month to month. You think of a baby that's not able to turn over, not able to sit up, not able to reach for objects, not able to do anything motorically to speak of, you know, just lots of reflexive behavior. And then you look at a one-year-old, many of them can walk, some can run, you know, and those who can't walk yet are crawling like demons and, and getting into things and picking up little Cheerios and raisins. And that. So, you know, development during the infancy period is just incredibly rapid. Some of the developmental milestones in the first year must be achieved within a very narrow range of time. For instance, babies only have about two weeks to hit that first smile. But other motor milestones have a much broader range for what's considered normal. For example, babies may walk anywhere from nine months to 18 months. There's a lot of variability in early motor development. It's an incredibly wide range. Some children will start doing something like sitting up or crawling and other, at, at a certain time, and then other children will be doing it three or four months later. So if your, own, if your child doesn't map on exactly onto what the, the, the charts or the experts say is in terms of motor milestones, that's really not something to be uh, concerned about, unless it's way, way outside the norm. And then perhaps it's time to sort of talk to uh, an expert about it. Any missed milestone, I think, shouldn't be cause for sheer overwhelming panic and elaborate medical tests. It just puts this child on the watch list. Let's keep a good eye on this child to make sure that they're catching up, they're making, making milestones on time, and, and then we can take them off the watch list. During the 12 to 24 month period, the child's physical rate of growth slows down while the physical skills improve. The glass begins to put more liquid in the mouth than down the shirt. The spoon is starting to scoop and get to the mouth. Prior to this, if it's in the scooping position, when it gets to the mouth, they roll it so it comes to the mouth upside down. Or if it comes to the mouth right side up, it's because they're scooping with the back side of the spoon. And for most children, by the time they reach their first birthday, they either have already or are very close to taking their first steps. For other children, walking may still be months away, but late walking doesn't mean that other motor skills will also be delayed. It's not quite clear um, sort of how all of these motor skills are related. Often you see children who develop gross motor skills early, like walking or running, tend to have a whole set of gross motor skills that have developed pretty early. But that may not mean that their fine motor skills are developing at the same rate. So just because you walk early doesn't mean you're necessarily going to um, you know, be able to create letters real, really nicely at an early age. We certainly know about the late walker. There is a familial late walker. Everybody in the, nobody in the family walks till they're 18 months old. This is reported. These kids are perfectly normal. I mean, they are going to Harvard or they are going to vocational school or whatever is in the, in the genetic makeup of that family, but they're all late walkers. Often it, during that period of time, around 18 months to two years, they'll have reached half their adult height. Um, they're also walking much more proficiently. You'll see much better balance control. You'll also see much better sort of arm and finger control as well. So the child will be able to pick up a lot of smaller objects, may be able to stack blocks on top of each other.
The 24 to 36 month period is sometimes referred to as the terrible twos, but they're not terrible. They're just becoming more independent as they practice and perfect their newfound skills. I think two-year-olds get a bad rap in part because they're highly mobile, they're highly curious, and it, uh, those kinds of things allow them to get into a lot of things. Most parents are so excited when their child takes their first step. They don't realize that when the child takes their first step, that means the child can get into a lot more things and a lot of potentially dangerous things as well. And that means that the parent needs to be on guard a lot more. And so that's when the parent starts establishing limits, using the word no, um, trying to prevent the child from actually hurting themselves. And so you've got this, this physically active, very curious child who doesn't necessarily have the cognitive skills to know what's dangerous and what's not. They're getting to the point where, yes, they can feed themselves, but they still make a mess. Yes, they can dress themselves somewhat, but they can't really do buttons, and they get things on backwards. And, and so they both want to do things on their own, and they want to assert themselves, but they are limited in what they can do. Around the third birthday, children begin to be able to put together some of the self-help skills they've been working on in the past year and become more capable at things like being able to dress themselves or at least to undress themselves. In the three to four year range, children are basically getting better balance. They'll begin to run. They'll begin to jump more effectively. When children first begin to jump, they actually put a lot of effort into it but don't get off the ground. Um, and so jumping skills, those kinds of things uh, be, sort of develop and become better. Also, you see much better fine motor kinds of skills develop. So children become better. This is when they can typically begin to produce simple shapes when they draw. It's also um, when they could perhaps begin to make their first letters. Um, but not all children would be able to do that. Um, also, children would be able to button buttons, zip zippers, so they're able to do some of the kinds of things that allow them to get dressed in the morning on their own. The pencil is no longer held like this. They're trying to make attempts to hold the pencil in a more functional position to use. Um, they're learning to button buttons and zip zippers. Um, by age three, say, they could pull their pants up, but if it's got a zipper or a button, they're stuck. They can get their jacket on, but they can't zip it up. And by this age, they can do that. They're starting to color and stay reasonably within the lines. The stack of blocks just keeps getting taller and taller as they go on, so it's more of a fine tuning. One major accomplishment for children at this age is becoming toilet trained. And as with other skills, some children have overnight success, while others take much longer to train and continue to have accidents for many months afterwards. Children can't be toilet trained before they understand what the sensation of is, you know, that I have to pee or I have to have a bowel movement and they have to be able to recognize that sensation and then put it into action and make a plan to, oh, now I need to go to the potty. And that doesn't sound all that complicated to us, but it is pretty complicated for them. And so it, it depends on the child, but, you know, somewhere around three seems to be a po point when most kids are, are really capable of doing that whole thing themselves, recognizing the sensation, having them being planful enough to get there, and so on. In other cultures where they're not so dependent upon diapers, there may be more of a need to um, kind of get the toilet training down earlier. Um, it seems that most children s sort of know when they're ready for it, and so I wouldn't I wouldn't advocate kind of pushing children um, to try to get them toilet trained at an earlier, earlier age. The 48 to 60 month period is a year of growth and strength. It's also a time of refining small motor skills, many of which will be needed when they start elementary school. At that stage, we really all start to look for um, at least parents and preschool teachers start to look for skills that we talk about in terms of kindergarten readiness, school readiness skills, and some of it has to do with their, their, their various their motor skills, like can the child begin to write letters, um, and, you know, hold writing implements and, and make recognizable scratches that look like their name, even if the letters are all going in different directions. For the most part, the, the four and five year olds, you're just seeing improvements in most areas of motor skill development. So children are getting better at, even better at fine motor skills. They might be able to draw a little bit more complicated shapes, things like crosses or X's. 
Um, they might be able to manipulate a scissors. Um, but for the most part, you're seeing sort of improvements in skills that the child already has. You don't see sort of a qualitative shift in the skills between a three-year-old and a five-year-old for the most part. These later preschool years are a time when the differences in development of siblings may be more obvious. Will the development be different from the first child to the second child? Motor milestones, no. But some of the later ones, some of the later gross motor milestones will. I like to tell parents that your first child will be seven years old before the training wheels come off your bike, their bike. The second child will may very well be four or five years old when the training wheels come off because my big brother or sister don't have training wheels. I don't need them either. By the time a child reaches the age of five, his body is usually slimmer and looks more proportionate. But in skills, there's still a broad range for what's thought to be normal ability for children who are about to enter kindergarten. Some five-year-olds, particularly girls, may be able to tie their own shoes and print alphabet letters legibly. Others may not be ready or just not interested in taking time out of their day to learn. This example where, you know, some girls can tie their shoes and other kids can't when they enter school is another example of how wide the variability is in different kinds of motor skills. And just because a child can't tie their shoe when they enter kindergarten doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be um, cognitively delayed or that they're going to have trouble tying their shoes as an adult. Um, it just means that for that child, their sort of fine motor skills may be slightly, you know, delayed. But that doesn't mean that there's necessarily a problem there. There also doesn't seem to be a relationship between motor development and intellectual development. Gross motor milestones do not seem to correlate very well with intellectual development. Is this child going to be an A student or is this child going to be a C student? Motor milestones don't forecast any of that for us. One obvious physical milestone for many five-year-olds is losing their first baby tooth. For parents, it doesn't seem like more than a few moments ago that sharp little tooth was poking its way through their baby's gums. And now, here it is, a sort of trophy, symbolizing the passage from infancy to childhood in five extremely short years.